April 14th, 1999 was a spring day like any others. It was a cloudy day with hints of sunlight here and there in my hometown of Mitrovica in Kosovo. I was 15 at the time and I was home with my mom, my dad and my uncle. <clears throat> The only safe space for us to be in our home was in our basement. You see, we were in the midst of a war waged by Slobodan Milosevic, who was the then president of Serbia, who was determined to ethnically cleanse Kosovo of all Albanians and non-Serbs, communities that comprised 80% of the population of Kosovo. Everywhere surrounding us were Serbian snipers, hidden in people's homes, shooting at random. On this particular day, my father had started carving a wooden sculpture to make the time pass, and my mother had just baked a fresh loaf of bread. You see, in a war zone like ours, all the stores were looted and burned, so all we had left was the flower reserves we had in our basement, and my mother had started using those. My uncle was wandering from room to room as he tried to make the time pass. So you're probably wondering what I was doing and how I was feeling. Well, I was really bored. I had started ordering my sort of book collection initially in an alphabetical order, and then by color order, and then ultimately by book size. None of those work to pass the time, by the way. So, because I was a teenager who was intent on rebelling against that which my parents had told me not to do, on that specific day, I climbed up to the second floor of our home, and I crawled out to the balcony, hid behind a concrete slab, which was supporting the, the railings of our balcony, and from there, I wasn't ready to see what I, what, what I began to see. We couldn't escape anywhere. The next thing I remember hearing is a gunshot somewhere in the distance and the sound of our home door slamming. I climbed up the stairs and tried to get to our home, uh, to the main floor, to see what had happened to our house door. And just as I was doing that, I was met by a uh, Serbian paramilitary man who was masked, and the only thing I could see were two brown eyes. And at that exact moment, he, took, he pointed his AK-47 at me and said, you gotta leave, you gotta get out of your house within five minutes or you will be shot. I ran as fast as I could to the kitchen to tell my mother that what had just happened, but I didn't have to say much because she had already heard, and she had already wrapped that fresh loaf of bread in a tablecloth, and she put on a thin jacket. My father grabbed his wood carving tools and a blanket, and my uncle, <clears throat> well, my uncle simply followed us with his empty hands behind his back. That day, we rushed out from our street to join a line of people who were walking in an endless line. Our hometown of close to 100,000 people was getting emptied as fast as it could by this army of military individuals who we couldn't see, whose faces we couldn't see, but whose eyes we would remember to this date and probably for as long as we live. We joined this chaotic line of people who were carrying their life's belongings that were now reduced to a bag, a plastic bag, maybe two bags if they were lucky, the only things they could grab during their own hectic moments. We lost our uncle in that line, and we never saw him again. Ten years later, my cousin discovered the remains of my uncle in a mass grave.
that day, my parents decided to grab me by my hand and never let go until we had come to the end of our journey. And the end of that journey did not come very easy. For nine days, we walked without knowing where we were going. Every day, the Serbian police stopped us and ordered us to go back to our homes. And just as we began our walks and we walked for two hours, another car of long-haired, armed military men would stop us and tell us, you have to go back the same way you just came. We didn't know where we were going. We walked in rain, we walked in wind, we walked in fog, we walked in sun, any kind of weather you could imagine. And during this journey, <clears throat> by the second day of our travel, our journey, our feet were so swollen that we wanted to take our shoes off so badly. But we didn't dare do that, because if we did, we were worried that we wouldn't be able to get them, we, wouldn't, uh, we couldn't get them back on. My mother's loaf of bread was soaked from all the rain, so every time we wanted to eat, we had to squeeze the water out of it to eat what we could. In small villages we walked past, the wells were poisoned, so our only way of hydrating ourselves became collecting rainwater in jars, in, uh, in glass jars that we had collected along the side of the road. By the ninth day of our walk, we realized that we were approaching Albania. We had walked close to 300 kilometers. <clears throat> At the border, the border guard, who was also Serbian, ordered my parents to give up every single piece of doc uh, travel or any kind of identity they had, identification they had. And so they did, because we wanted to be alive, we wanted to be free in any way. In, in that moment, it was a relative thing. My parents gave up their passports, their IDs, their marriage certificate. They gave up my documentation, anything they, they had on me. And just as that border guard took those pieces of paper and tossed them on a pile of what must have been thousands of other people's documents, we came to the realization that at that moment, we became stateless, we became nameless, we became non-existent. We entered Albania as refugees who could not return to their homeland. But the people who had to live in refugee camps such as these for close to a year and a half. In fact, we lived in refugee camps, seven of them, for a year and a half before we came to Canada as resettled refugees and made St. John's our home. You know, sometimes it feels that I should be older than I am. No child or youth should have experienced or witnessed the kind of things that I've seen. When I came here, I began to speak about my experience as often as I could because I felt that in some way I had that hope that it might help somebody or it might make a difference in someone's life someday. And I was recognized for those efforts, but that's not the only reason why I did them or even the reason why I did them. I had the honor of becoming a Rhodes Scholar and, and completing a master's at Oxford University, which allowed me to spend two years studying the aftermath of conflict and the nature and the consequences of war. Until recently, I would have said that this is a story about overcoming adversity. This is a story about overcoming insurmountable challenges that human beings are able to overcome. I would have said that if adversity is a bridge we have to cross, long ago have I crossed it and have come into the land of opportunity. After all, since coming here, my life has been largely about the pursuit of success, opportunity, the chance to make a difference in someone's life. 
But uh, I guess I should tell you something else, which is a story that uh, figured just recently in a discussion that I was having with a friend about adversity. She asked me a simple but a thought-provoking question that made me question everything that I had thought I'd overcome. And it was, do we ever overcome adversity? That night, I spent hours thinking about the challenges in my life and whether I had really overcome them, whether those di difficulties in my life were really all behind me. I, reminded my, I remembered that, that day that no matter how many times I share memories of war, it always hurts just the same way that I told them, just the same way that it hurt the first time that I shared those memories. And I don't anticipate that that pain will ever go away. You see, my difficulty and my challenge, my adversity, wasn't necessarily the experience that I had witnessed. It was the memory of that experience. And that realization prompted, and, and prompted me and reminded me of another fact and another quote. <clears throat> by Yosef Yerushalmi, who said he was a Holocaust survivor, and his quote rings true in my mind all the time. He said, my terror of forgetting is greater than the terror of having too much to remember. My realization was that I hadn't overcome the adversity of the horrifying memories of my experience, but that I had learned to manage them and I had learned to bridge them bridge the symptoms thereof, I should say. So ultimately, those two blind eyes, those two brown eyes of the paramilitary man who pointed his gun at me are as live and as real right now as I stand before you today, and I can't see all of you right now, <clears throat> as they were the day that, that, they, that he saw me and I, or I saw him. The smell of freshly baked bread still continues to bring back memories of that day when our loaf of bread was the only thing we took away from our home. And long lineups in grocery stores continue to bring back memories of the lineup that I once joined, not knowing where I was going to end up. If my emotional reaction is outwardly calm right now, it's because I know it's all a memory. Even that comes with a disclaimer, because it's a painful memory, but it's a memory. So, my process of self-reflection helped me realize that we don't sometimes overcome adversity. We learn to manage it. Adversity Picturing adversity as a bridge that we have to overcome, simply as something that begins and something that is overcome, can be far too simplistic and far too incomplete. You see, my place in this bridge is very different. I find myself completely comfortable in the middle of adversity and its overcoming. That's become my mental home, because my memories of the past help me appreciate the present and the future much more than I ever would have thought possible. I've learned to let my adversity inspire me and not depress me, however painful it might be. I'd like you to picture something else now, and I have this complex graph, or a relatively complex graph, but it's not really at all complicated. I'd like you to picture <clears throat> yourselves in my place. Adversity is always on one side of the bridge, and on the other side of the bridge, I'd like you to picture the ability that you have to transform that adversity into inspiration, so that you don't remain a victim of your experience, but you become a survivor. Ultimately, what I've discovered is, is that it's up to us to choose which way we go. I'd like to go back, please. <laughs> Thank you. That's the direction I choose to go. 
Because if we don't, what ends up happening is that the inability to transform our experience into inspiration brings us back to adversity. And what that does is that it makes us a greater victim than we have been when we witness that experience, that difficult time. So to avoid this vicious cycle, let's choose the other way to go. I've discovered that we choose the way to go. I'd urge you to choose to transform your adversity, your challenge to inspiration so that you may move on. Thank you very much. Thank you.